Hey, what's up everyone? Mendel here. Hope you are all doing awesome and wonderful. So before we dive into the interview with Steve, the creator of NAM, I thought I'd make a quick little intro to give you a kind of an idea what NAM or Neural AM Model XC is and a bit of the train of thought before we dive into the subject. So NAM or Neural AM Modeler is a free piece of software which lets you capture your own AMs or plugins or even hardware EQs or I even seen people make a capture of tape machines. Basically, let's focus on the amps for this now, but basically it lets you capture your amp um, very, very accurately. So more accurate than the Kemper, more accurate than the Quad Cortex, more accurate than Tone X. It's, as far as I know, the most accurate one. And then basically lets you use that capture uh, in plugin format or in standalone format. Now, the reason I'm so stoked about this is one of the reasons I told earlier is it's the most accurate as of this date. So again, more accurate than the Kemper, more accurate than the Quad Cortex, more accurate than the Tonex. But the second reason is it's fully free. There's even a website called Tone Hunt where you can download your favorite amp. Just type in the name, you download it, you put the file into NAM, and there you have it. There you have the feel, in my opinion, it's like 99% there, the feel of the amp and the sound of the amp. The only thing you have to do is put an IR after it, an impulse response of a cabinet, but Steve is working on an, a solution to also be able to capture very accurately with a cab or uh, an impulse response. So there's that. The reason this subject fascinates me is there's no more excuse to not have a good tone. There hasn't been for the past 12 years, to be honest. But for example, a Kemper is now at 800 euros. The Quad Cortex is about the same. I think Tonex Pedal is 400 euros or the software could be a bit cheaper, but this is free. It's the most accurate one. It's fully free. Uh, on my system, actually, it's, it's pretty lightweight. Um, I already use it to mix clients. I love playing through it. I'm like waking up, I'm like, okay, I don't have a JP2C and as of this date, um, JP2C or Mesa amps are not being sold in Europe. So let's type in JP2C download a JP2C capture and just have fun with it and be inspired and create something. I also made one of my own captures that I put on Tone Hunt. It's a Mesa Boogie Road King 2, one of my favorite amps, going to the power amp of an EVH 5153 Stealth 606. Uh, sounds amazing in my opinion. You can download it for free, links in the description box down below. Also make sure, uh, if you want to, join the Facebook group of Neural Amp Modeler. It's, it feels like a warm community. Everyone's saying, hey, I have this amp. I put those captures up on Tone Hunt or uploaded to my... Okay, where was I? Where was I? Oh yeah, the Facebook group. So there's also a Facebook group called Neural Amp Modeler. You can join it. And it's basically like this big warm community where people are like, hey, I have this amp, just put it on Tone Hunt or upload it to my drive or Dropbox. Or I have this rare amp. I make a capture of it, put it on Tone Hunt, let me know what you think. And it's like, man, is this the future? Because it, it feels pretty cool, in my opinion. Anyway, so I got to sit down with Steven Ecktason, the creator of Neural Amp Modeler, and ask him some few questions about the current state, the community, and the future. So, let's dive right in. Here we go. What's up, Steve? How are you? Hey, Mendel. It's, uh, I mean, it's good to talk with you. Um, you know, things, uh, things have been busy over here. But, I can uh, imagine. Uh, we're trying to uh, trying to keep everything in order, trying to keep my head on with everything that's going on. Right. You know, I'm getting back into things after uh, having been over at the NAM show uh, last weekend. Yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun. You know, um, the neural lamp modeler NAM has been uh, you know coming along, and there's been a lot of folks uh, with you know a lot of interest and. Um, yeah, it's it's just been it's just been a really crazy time, you know, getting to getting to meet new people, getting to kind of hear uh, what people are thinking about it, and uh, you know, trying to juggle that all with everything else that's going on in life. <laughs> right, I can imagine. So, just out of curiosity, like, how old are yeah. you? Yeah, uh, I am thirty four right now. I'm I'm just so blown away because I'll we'll, we'll jump in the next question in a bit, uh -huh. but I love these bigger companies, for example, like Kemper, mm -hmm. DSP, IK Multimedia. Yeah, uh, doing this capture thing, and then this dude over here <laughs> somehow has cracked the code and even does it better, which is was mind blowing. But we'll dive into that a bit later. Um, 
could you just introduce yourself a bit, talk a bit of yourself, like who are you? Because I think a lot of people are curious, like who is this guy who created this neural ab modeler? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is Steven Atkinson. Um, I am, uh, I, I, uh, I'm over here in the US and uh, kind of my background, if this kind of helps it uh, make sense, kind of where I'm coming from. Um, I have, I went to school for uh, mechanical engineering, but I've kind of gotten into machine learning um, after I got out of school, just basically because, you know, when I, w when I was in school, that was about the time when, you know, some of the cool little things started showing up on folks' smartphones. So I always like to say that one of the cool things that really caught my attention was that, um, you know, like the voice recognition stuff uh, right. started coming out while I was in school. And, you know, I was kind of, you know, doing my studies, but, you know, this was like really interesting. And I was kind of just naturally curious about it. And so, you know, once I got out of school, I, you know, um, you know, just started uh, trying to like, you know, tr uh, transition like my technical expertise and get kind of more into ML. And so, um, Basically, the way that I managed to do that was kind of like I got one foot off the uh, off my previous uh, off the previous boat and into the other one, and I kind of ended up doing kind of this uh, sort of machine learning that is more applied to problems in like the physical sciences and the in the natural sciences instead of like you know trying to like machine learn about people. I'm machine learning about gadgets and all uh, all sorts of cool stuff like that, and like doing uh, just basically finding out how uh, ML can be used to help us kind of like understand and work with like a lot of high tech gizmos and stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, uh, when, I, uh, when I started like looking at the neural amp modeler uh, thing, that was, mm, I think I had been doing ML things for maybe about two years or so. Okay. And you know, I hadn't really had a chance to do anything that was really um, ML for fun things. You know, it was just kind of getting into like serious applications. But I've played guitar for a long time and I've been a fan of digital gear. Like um, back when I was kind of looking at this, I think that the lay of the land was like there was the Axe Effects and I was aware of the Kemper. And I think I had written down to myself at one point that there was this new thing, the Helix. <laughs> oh, right, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, actually, like, Neural Amp Modeler, um, the actual, like, little hobby project actually started uh, about four years ago is what my uh, YouTube video history tells me, is that there's a, there's a video, if you kind of scroll down a bit, um, where I was kind of like testing out where it had been. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the the kind of backdrop was that, um, you know, I, I was interested in ML, was interested in guitar, wanted to do something kind of for fun that brought the two things together. And with this kind of like backdrop of digital gear becoming more and more impressive, more and more useful, I was kind of wondering, hey, can uh, ML do this? And um, honestly, I wasn't exactly aware of anyone else at the time that was trying to use machine learning to, uh, model guitar gear. Cause this was back at like the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. Okay. And so, yeah, it was supposed to just kind of be for fun. So I purposely didn't look for any hints. I just kind of said, okay, I've you know, got two years of experience. How much of this can I just kind of figure out using the intuition that I've got? And I like to say this kind of like a crossword puzzle. Um, you don't want to like go looking for the answer. The fun is to just kind of work through it. And uh, the journey. Yeah, exactly. Like just like taking those problems, challenge yourself and kind of say, hey, can I figure this out myself? And you feel good if you can, you feel clever. So um, yeah, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of the background and how this got started is that I just wanted to kind of make a crossword puzzle out of ML and <laughs> guitar and, uh, seems that it worked out fairly well. Um, yeah. 
Oh, oh, well, I, I, I would agree. <laughs> yeah, because, because, when, and this takes to the next question. Like, yeah. what's your view on the current hype? Because it's, as I see it, it's now like a huge spike. Mm -hmm. And if, we, and if, and if, even if we, and so, sorry, I'm interrupting you, but no, go ahead. Okay, and even if we look at the um, the Facebook group, like sometimes in a week time we have a thousand new members or fifteen hundred new members, like it's catching on. Mm -hmm. My first question is, what's your view on that? And then the second question is, how is it that it now like it's going like t through the roof? Yeah. So my impression of it, um, well, the uh, uh, like the little dashboard on Facebook, right, gives me like this little uh, curve, so that I can kind of see that there was a point in kind of late February where the slope just just has this little <laughs> like uh, this little elbow in it and it just took off. And actually the funny thing about that was that it happened while I was like taking a vacation and it was like the first time in a long time that I had like, you know, really kind of like tried to unplug from things. And so like we were out in the mountains and I had like no internet access, no cell phone access. And so like I, we went into town to kind of like check on, you know, stuff. And then my phone just blows up <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, folks decided that weekend that, you know, that this was interesting and that they wanted to know more. And so my initial reaction was honestly a lot of stress because I wasn't ready for it. I've never uh -huh. done something that's gotten so much attention from people. And honestly, the first thing that I, the first thing that came to mind was like, am I going to be ready to, you know, kind of guide and admin this community that's just decided to blow up? Right. And so the initial reaction honestly was like a lot of, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of stress, a lot of like, I haven't done this before. And this is all in the backdrop of like, again, up until this point, like very few people knew about this. I was just kind of like going around as like a regular dude, just like making little YouTube videos about this thing that I was kind of tinkering with. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I got this, like this indication that like, okay, this is going to start going somewhere, I guess. And all of the questions that I'd never really thought about uh, just related to visibility and just kind of like having more attention to the things that I do, the things that the community that's starting to grow is going to do with this. And so it was really kind of like, all right, we need to make sure that this community that this community is going to be one that is positive minded, like just to kind of like help people kind of nudge and suggest that like, you know, I want people to think of this as a positive thing. I want people to realize that, um, you know, there's this possibility here for them to get like a tool that can really help them be a happier person as a musician, like something that really, you know, you, you like plug into, you start playing and it, uh, it excites you. It makes you happy to be a guitarist. It makes you happy to be playing the guitar and to just kind of take, like that was my, that was my number one goal is to basically make sure that this gets taken in the right direction. Like mm -hmm. the whole thing about like uh, member count and the group, just like the group size. Like I know that there were a lot of folks that got really excited about that, especially like the early adopters, like those first like 100, 200 people in the group. Like they, like a lot of those folks are super fans and they're getting really excited and they're saying like, we need to spread the word far and wide. And I'm just looking at it going like, okay, like by all means, like let folks know that you're enjoying this, but like don't go like knocking down everyone's doors because <laughs> that's going to make this thing blow up even faster. And I'm just trying to keep up with it. <laughs> and actually what, what I, uh, because I joined that Facebook group, I think a month ago or something. Uh, the thing I noticed about the neural AM model group or NAM group the most, mm -hmm. it feels, and perhaps some people will cringe now, but it feels like a warm family mm -hmm. who all have this, common uh, idea of just helping each other yeah as much as possible yeah definitely and i think that it makes sense that 
it would kind of uh, select for itself in that way, especially in, especially earlier on. Because uh, uh, let me let me use this as an opportunity to just kind of call out the stuff that's not great about it right now, right? It's you know it's something that um, you know it's in beta. It's something that you know we're kind of constantly working on stuff. My background, again, being like, you know, just working on ML stuff and do it, just like solving these problems, the whole thing of like bringing it into a plugin, having it run in real time, all these little things that make it kind of more accessible for the average guitarist. That's like, mm -hmm. honestly, that's that's out of my area of expertise. And so like there's rough edges, and like even today and even more so back then. So the folks who were really excited about it, despite all that, yeah, uh, it's got to be like the sort of person who is uh, willing to work through some of the uh, some of the rough edges and help each other out, kind of figure out the answers to these things. Like uh, those are going to be the folks that stop by, have a look, and stick around. Uh, yeah, so I definitely I definitely agree with you that they're. What, there's kind of like this uh, set of like early adopters folks that really kind of dove deep on the tech. They were really kind of figuring out what are the knobs that I can turn in here? How can I get the accuracy even higher? Yeah, right, right. Which, <laughs> which, is, which is just kind of nuts. And folks have figured out some really clever stuff as, you know, they've tried to dive into it. And frankly, there have even been things that people have discovered that surprise me, like, It'd be really tempting to say, hey, I wrote this software. I understand what's going on here. But when you take that and square it up against hundreds or thousands of other people who are just kind of poking around at it, people find stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of cool. It's just this other um, source of insights and all that has a lot of stuff that, you know, just wasn't that wasn't even on my map. So there's, there's one, there's one example that I, that uh, really kind of stands out to me and it kind of exemplifies this like, you know, community of folks that are helping each other out and sharing what they figure out. Um, there was, there was a group member who was messing around with training some models and they found out that if they just made the output uh, wave file louder, that it would be more accurate and the folks oh. that the folks that know like what's going on here and know that you know like you should be able to rescale everything everyone they're they're kind of looking at that myself included going all right there's so there's something that's not exactly right here it's probably some misunderstanding uh but they kept on insisting about it they showed some plots like with like some of the kind of like outputs like this ESR that folks like to kind of chase and drive down and it's lower on their plots. And so I'm like, okay, either something wrong is going on in the code and I need to fix it or else something really weird is going on. Mm -hmm. So I kind of dove into it. I double checked the math and I'm like, okay, the math is right. So what's going on here? <laughs> why is this, why is this helping? So and, and, and what was it? So there's a there's a spot in it turns out that this is this is getting pretty geeky in the uh, in the kind of insides of Let's the neural geeky. network. But we're gonna do it. Uh, any uh, anyone who who is uh, listening to this and is here for some of like some juicy like tech nuggets, uh, you know, here this one's for you. Uh, <laughs> the the network that a lot of folks are using it, it's called a WaveNet. Um, it's got a bunch of layers, you know, this is a deep neural network and folks, you know, can kind of, uh, you know, may have heard that these like uh, computer models have a lot of layers that kind of compute on their inputs uh, one after another. And the thing about the WaveNet is that each of these layers kind of like dumps out part of the answer. And so you get kind of like the first part of the answer based on just a little bit of calculation, then the next part adds a little bit more onto it, and so on and so on. And all of these kind of like pieces of the answer get put together, and uh, that kind of uh, that kind of gets combined and results in the actual like predicted output sounds that you get. Well, the thing about it was that all of those pieces were getting summed together and the numbers were getting 
really big because there were a lot of layers. And basically the next part that took that number wasn't set up to kind of learn very well if the numbers were too big. And so as I was kind of like drilling through it, that's what I kind of noticed. And I noticed that like, okay, but if the output that it's trying to get to is also really big, then everything kind of looks a little bit, uh, kind of works out. And so I was like, wait a minute, that's really weird. I don't like that. So I just like added this piece in the network that shrinks down that, that part of the calculation that wasn't part of, you know, what the original, you know, sort of architecture was supposed to do. And sure enough, this whole thing just like starts training even, even better, even faster. And so like the amount of time that it would take to train a model, like dropped, um, I want to say like by half to be conservative, oh. but, um, it might've even been more than that. Like this was like, just like one of these little things that just really improved how well the whole thing worked. And it was right. all from this, and it was all from this group member who just said like, Hey, this looks kind of weird. Right. What's going on, Steve? And I was like, okay, I'll have a look. And we found hey. something kind of cool. <laughs> Oh, cool. Awesome community. So, so, so while we're diving, diving, diving deeper into this, mm -hmm. um, what says about the accuracy of different models? Like NAM is on the top. Like it beats, definitely beats the Kemper. It beats the Quad Cortex. It beats Tonex. And here's this dude called Steven from the US who beat all those companies. Now, just putting it very bluntly, how is that possible? <laughs> is it just coincidence? What, what is it? Because I can imagine like, because I also think, and I'm not sure about this, but mm -hmm. because it's more accurate, it becomes sort of talk of the town. Like, hey, it's more accurate than Tone X and this. Let's mm -hmm. check it out. Yeah. So how come? Yeah. So let me give this answer in two parts. Or no, it's, it's just going to be one part. Okay. Um, the answer is, number one, it seems like what I built was basically in the neighborhood of what a good solution would look like. And also, um, you know, after I, after I did like kind of my initial guess, then I did open the book and say like, okay, how am I doing? Um, and like tried out a few of the tricks from, uh, from other people's papers. And some of them helped a little bit, but like there was nothing that was like fundamentally like uh, like changing things in a huge way. So, uh, so why why did it end up kind of like uh, ranking so nicely? Um, well, one of the one of the things that I got to do since you know I've got full control over all of the little settings that you can do inside and folks that are using this also have access to it because they've got the entire source code that I've written. They can change anything that I wrote. Mm -hmm. Basically that gives folks the opportunity to trade off, uh, between accuracy and, uh, the amount of, uh, CPU usage that this thing, uh, uh, does. And some of the code is really inefficient and uh, that can be improved to bring down the CPU usage. But I suspect that the trade off kind of the point that I picked traded off a little bit more on the side of accuracy than it did on being uh, light on the CPU. And a lot of the folks that, you know, kind of uh, found this and they were, you know, tech savvy, uh, you know, have kind of like, uh, more modern computers, they know how to set it up to make sure that the CPU can run at, uh, at you know, full usage. And they didn't notice that, uh, you know, early on that the CPU usage was higher than other plugins. Um, it may be the case that if you kind of back off, you know, on the size of the network and kind of go a little bit lighter that it's, I mean, the accuracy will go down. And at some point it's going to drop below you know, kind of what you'll get from uh, some of these other solutions. But um, basically the answer in a nutshell is that it can be more accurate because the ability to tune it that way as you would like it to be is available to you. Um, mm. this, is, this is basically something that uh, works really well for someone who's a power user and really wants to make it work for them exactly the way that they have in mind. So... 
Uh, maybe maybe that's maybe that's like the it's it's a little bit uh, it may be like uh, a little bit less of a, a magic answer, but I think that it's maybe the most honest answer that I can give is that it can be more this, more that than other people like other uh, like uh, modelers stuff out there because it can be whatever the person using it wants it to be. Mm-hmm. And I think that's you know kind of a cool thing to put in uh, people's hands, basically to say here's the here's the nugget of it, tweak it as you'd like, you know, make it make you happy. That's the most satisfying answer I've probably ever heard. Yeah, no, I fully agree. So I perhaps some stuff could be secret, but talking about Nam, what are the future plans of it? Mm-hmm. Because because something I I really admire you as um, as what I've seen digitally you as a person is mm-hmm. instead of going, yep, if you want to use this plugin, you have to pay a hundred bucks and uh, I'm going to close the code for an example. But like everything's very open, very accessible. So what are your future plans? Are there certain things set in stone from the oncoming weeks, months or something? Yeah. Just out of curiosity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'd love to kind of... Uh, share a little bit about my thoughts on this. So we'll take it in a few couple chunks. Uh, first chunk, let's talk about uh, the repositories that are out there that are licensed uh, with these nice open source licenses. Uh, these are, There are three code repositories out there. There is Neural App Modeler with hyphens. This is the training code that people can use to make new models. There is Neural Amp Modeler Core, which is kind of the nuts and bolts of the uh, CPU processing stuff that you can use to make plugins. And then there is Neural Amp Modeler Plugin, which I suspect most people are familiar with, which kind of puts it all together. You you know, it makes a VST3, you load it up in your DAW. All three of these are currently licensed with an MIT license. And... Uh, For folks that don't know a lot about open source software and licensing, basically what this means is that uh, folks can do a lot of things uh, with this uh, with this code. Um, You can use it uh, if you're a company uh, as uh, part of a product that you are developing. And the terms of this are very favorable for uh, for businesses. So, um, you know, this was something that I kind of decided way back when I was uh, starting to work on it. You know, again, kind of like resetting our, our uh, you know, frame of mind back into like the late 2010s. The, um, the attitude in a lot of machine learning was that, you know, we're figuring things out, we're solving these puzzles, we're making tools that are going to kind of be the foundation of what comes next as people kind of take them and combine them and use them to kind of uh, solve problems that people are having in a kind of more packaged way. You know, this uh, plugin that uh, that I've written as a kind of prototypical example of it. But um, yeah, the licensing basically means that these things are available as a resource for uh, companies to work with. And I am... Uh, really, really happy to have it be that way. So, um, you know, if you want to kind of zoom, if you want to kind of zoom out and take stock of the various um, pieces that you have to work with, if you're kind of looking at this saying, what can I do uh, in order to kind of like use this uh, uh, to make like the next generation of like plugins or tools for musicians or guitarists, You've got the technology, uh, and there's this you know open source MIT source code. You've also got this community of people, and I think one thing that's really cool about it is that this discussion about where do people see uh, you know neural amp modeler right now, and where do they want it to go is all getting discussed in the open, and there are thousands of voices that are contributing to that discussion. So it's this kind of idea vortex uh, with like a whole bunch of energy and a lot of ideas. 
And so someone who's looking at this should see those two resources. And then there's the third part that they, uh, that they would bring, which is basically the insight and uh, opinions to kind of impose order on those two first pieces and basically say, here's how I'm going to make it come together as a product. Um, this is, you know, normally a product is much more than just, um, you know, doing like one task, like think of, think of, um, any of the VST plugins that you have, there's a whole bunch more different pieces to it than just like, you know, uh, a guitar amplifier simulation, um, at, mm -hmm. at a very at, at a very mundane level, you know, usually you'll have some sort of cabinet emulation. Of course, you'll probably have uh, a variety of stomp box effects. You know, maybe some quality of life stuff like tuners and and the like. But um, you know, when you think about like this kind of like class of like uh, um, amp snapshotting technology, there's also usually like a um, community that goes with it, like a library of tones that other people have uh, modeled. And that was one of the things that like popped out really, uh, re uh, really loud uh, in the uh, in the community in this neural amp modeler community is people are saying, where can I access all these different models that people that people have made? And right. like, there was a little file dump thing. And it was very, uh, bare bones and not what people have in mind when they're thinking about like, what does this look like when it kind of reaches its full potential as a product, as something that looks really nice, something that just really gets me excited again as mm -hmm. a musician. This is a tool that I'm using, but it's also something that kind of feeds into my inspiration. So um, that's what kind of, that's the, that's the summary idea that I'm really excited about, uh, thinking okay. forward is that, uh, folks that kind of see those pieces and have big ideas for them. You know, these are, these are basically resources that I'm hoping are going to like kind of lift, you know, have this like rising tide that lifts all boats and hopefully results in some really cool stuff for, uh, the community of musicians just overall. Right. Right, I fully agree, and I also think that's why because now um, that that website Tone Hunt is becoming really popular, mm -hmm. and for me, it's like feeling like I think for a lot of people, feel like a kid in a candy store. Like you yeah. try to find your favorite amp, and then play with it and feel. At least for me, I feel inspired when it feels really good. That's mm -hmm. why I say a lot of my videos, and that's why I love Nam because it actually feels really, really good because it's so accurate. I guess. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's very cool. Perhaps. A more personal question, but what's your favorite amp? Because oh, I think as boy. a guitar player, your favorite amp really defines how you listen to stuff and what kind of stuff you like. So yeah. I'm very curious about that. Oh boy. So um, that's going to obviously depend upon uh, what kind of music I'm playing. But um, let me just start with kind of like the, um, you know, the first thing that I would probably say is, you know, I like to play, you know, kind of high gain tones and man, I am just someone who I, I'm, I'm a fan of the 5150 tone. Um, it's hard to go wrong with like, with like a block letter with like a max on in front of it. That's just mm -hmm. such a, such an, such a, um, I don't want to say common, but it's, such a signature like idiomatic tone for like so much music that we hear and love and it's just yeah when i when i hear it that's like the sound of you know some of my favorite bands and um it just you know it it excites me this is like you know reminding me of just like the music that i that i love to hear so yeah, I'd have to say I'd have to say I mean it doesn't it's not the most like exciting amp uh, out there with like all the cool like boutique amps that are being made. Right, but right. man, if it doesn't just sound exactly like what I'm thinking of uh, whenever whenever I I like plug into one, I mean there's there's something to be said for that. Agreed. Um, Agreed. I I could think because we're about the same age. I think we we are the same age. I think we could say like when growing up in the mid 2000s of metal, that's like the staple of good metal guitar tone. Oh yeah. Like 
kill switch and gates. I mm -hmm. think Machine Head uses mm -hmm. 5150s. Yeah. So I'm not surprised you it was you had mentioned the 5150. Yeah. 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 And so cool. that like that's that's exactly like what does it for me in terms of high gain. Right. I think that's also worth uh, saying though, like what my favorite is for like um, kind of like, like cleanish, lower, yeah, low like cl gain? cleaner low gain stuff. There is a, you know, I've got to I've got to give a shout out to the Fender Deluxe Reverb, and here's why. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. Here um, we go. Because. You know, think about the, you know, sort of gigs where folks are playing in like a smaller like shop or something like that, really intimate, small settings, like the ones mm -hmm. where, you know, you're walking on the street and you can kind of hear inside the shop that someone's yeah, playing. Yeah, yeah. The sound that you get when you, you know, that sound that I kind of associate with like walking on the street, it is a sound that came from the speaker cabinet of a tube amp and is like bouncing around through the shop and comes out the door. And there is, there's basically this uh, feeling of like intimacy where the tone is coming straight out of like, out of a guitar cabinet. And usually that, you know, usually that amp's going to have to be like relatively like low wattage. It's going to have to be kind of, you know, it's gonna have to suit the space. Mm -hmm. And so just like thinking about the sorts of gigs that uh, that kind of fit that shape and the sorts of tones that you'll that you'll hear from those, there's just something that, you know, conjures up like memories that I think are really captured by the Fender Deluxe Reverb. So it's just kind of like the picture of that sort of feeling to me. And it's got a really special place in my heart for those reasons. My goodness. It's almost an ode to that app. It's so heartwarming to hear that. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Cool. And, and I really got to say that, like, you know, just to kind of like back out the context, you know, we're talking about a digital uh, simulation. It's using machine learning. This is all very high tech, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I just want to keep on coming back to it is that this is a tool and what it really needs to do at the end of the day is just kind of inspire and it has to serve the music that people are making. And so I personally really like to kind of like keep an eye out for all of those things just in general that are that are those kind of like sparks of inspiration just to kind of keep an open mind and kind of realize when something is really kind of helping the artistic vision come alive where are those coming from and how can we get more of that how can we um, take those and move them forward make them more accessible just all these sorts of questions but it all comes back to you know how can this serve artists better right okay so where do you think well like tech is moving so fast let's say within th in three years like where would like would everybody play toe next would would like boutique amps still be a thing because it goes so rapidly or will it go more downhill? Because the reason I'm asking is, I know a lot of people who are um, above 50 that used to be a bit more conservative, like stay away from new tech. Mm -hmm. And now, for example, when this Tone X pedal comes, comes out, I see a lot of people from different age groups going into this new form of technology mm -hmm. so what's so just what's your overview about that like where would this be within three years oh boy um sorry for the, asking it, such it, a no 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 it's <laughs> it's a it's it's such an interesting question because asking about the future three years out has never been more challenging Right. And that's exactly the why I'm asking. The rate of change. Yeah. The rate of change uh, in, man, just not only, not only the technology for musicians, but just like in the larger scene of like, yeah, what is ML? What is AI doing? Just kind of like in the bigger picture, things are moving faster than they ever have, than they ever have. And it would have been so difficult to anticipate three years ago that we would be where we are today. And I suspect that uh, it's going to be even more difficult to guess three years from today into the future. Um, number one, I really hope 
that we continue to see a thriving ecosystem of boutique guitar tones because I think that that's one of the things that uh, makes it like so much of a pleasure to be a guitarist in you know the 2020s is that we've never had more options and just the ability to get things uh, you know communicated to other people you know get people to see these new exciting products and um, yeah just like all all these options that we've had you know it's never it's never been better um, I hope that that is something that. Uh, at least stays around. I suspect that it will. Everyone wants to have, you know, unique tones. Everyone wants to, you know, everyone wants to see the options and the palette that they have expand. Like everyone wants to see something that is new and exciting to them. So, um, you know, instead of answering your question straight out, I would kind of say, okay, what are the ways in which we can give people unique sounds. How can I get more unique sounds for more people? What, what, are, the, what are the kind of building blocks that can uh, make that happen? I have some ideas. Okay. I think, I'm going to, I think I'm going to decline to make any bets on the details okay. of what the technology is going to look like that does that. Mm-hmm. But I think that we are going to see a continuing increase in the amount of variety of what uh, guitarists and artists have accessible to them in terms of like these tones that they're able to access. You know, um, think back decades, you've got like, you know, Fenders, Marshalls, like a few options. That grows a little bit. There's a few more established companies. There's boutique companies. Now there are libraries, you know, of of kind of uh, machine learning uh, modeled tones, uh, and you can see just like the number of different sounds that people have accessible to themselves are just continuing to, or just continuing to grow. So I think that if there's one thing that uh, it is going to, uh, that, uh, you know, kind of technology development and product development is going to do. It's going to be something that probably further increases that variety that's accessible to us. Because I think that's kind of the trend and the direction that we see a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of, um, you know, kind of uh, elements of art and content going, you know movies used to be made only by, you know, a few uh, studios that could afford to do so. YouTube shows up, YouTubers show up, and all of a sudden there's an explosion in the amount of options that we have there of what we look at. All right. So I wouldn't be surprised if like some of the kind of like trends of, uh, you know, content, diversity, frequency of like novel things uh, coming, uh, uh, coming out that interest people accelerates and kind of looks uh, a similar way to uh, what we've seen in other, you know, kind of in other areas. Cool. Okay. Great answer. Any last thing you want to add before we round this up? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> nothing, uh, nothing comes to mind. I mean, you've, you've, get, you've asked some really great questions that have allowed me to, kind of explore some of the really interesting uh, questions about, you know, where this came from, where it's at right now and where it's going. Mm -hmm. um, I would basically, uh, maybe I would basically say that, um, you know, I'm really, ex I'm really excited for where this technology, where it's taking us. And I think that one of the coolest parts about this has been, the ability to kind of walk through it with a bunch of different people. You know, this is like talking on Facebook groups, getting to talk with you. And um, I hope that, uh, that more and more folks get kind of involved in that uh, discussion, that kind of conversation, because I think that it's just a really cool opportunity for so many folks to get involved and kind of get to have a front row seat into 
you know, this kind of like, uh, you know, this like state of change that we're going through in, uh, you know, in, uh, the kind of the guitar gear, uh, ecosystem. So, yeah, I, I mean, I get, I guess that, I guess that, I guess that's it is, um, you know, contribute, um, you know, get involved, have fun with it, you know, see where that, see where that goes, see what sparks come out of it. I'm really excited for it. Cool. Steven, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, likewise. Thanks a bunch.